This video is made possible by the free-to-play action game Crossout. Check out the game through the link in the description below, and you can start with three extra weapons or a vehicle cabin just for registering. Few feats of engineering are as impressive as a military-grade helicopter. Today, worth millions of dollars each, these high-tech birds are a formidable military asset, including, among many other uses, for rescue operations. All a fact U.S. military personnel helpfully chose to ignore during Operation Frequent Wind when they pushed several dozens of them into the sea, in one case for no other reason than to save a mother, a father, and their five children. For anyone unfamiliar with it, Operation Frequent Wind was the name given to the final phase of evacuations after the fall of Saigon, effectively the final days of the Vietnam War. Noted as being one of the largest military evacuations in history and the largest involving helicopters as the primary means of evacuation, Operation Frequent Wind is celebrated as a logistical success for the US due to the fact that a few dozen helicopter pilots were somehow able to evacuate over 7,000 people in around 18 hours. This is made all the more impressive when you realize that the mass evacuation was never supposed to involve helicopters much at all. You see, while Operation Frequent Wind is now famous for being the most successful mass helicopter evacuation ever organized, using helicopters as the primary means of evacuation was never the original plan. It wasn't even the backup plan. It turns out that it was actually the backup plan to the backup of the backup plan. Known initially as Operation Talon Vise until North Vietnamese spies heard whispers of it, the plan of mass evacuation of Vietnam had been in place for several years and was originally supposed to involve the primary use of both commercial and military aircraft, which would evacuate at-risk citizens and military personnel, with the total slated to be evacuated estimated to be about 2 million people. Failing, or in addition to this, the idea was to dock ships at Saigon port and load them with as many people as possible. In the event none of these options were possible, the final Hail Mary plan was instead to use military helicopters to transport people to these ships located offshore. Of course, evacuating the original estimate of 2 million people was never an option for the helicopter plan alone, nor even the extremely whittled down number of about 100 to 200,000 that the military brass eventually reduced that figure too. Instead, at this point, it was just as many people as they could, as fast as they could. So why did the US have to fall back to literally their least effective option if they'd been planning the evacuation for years? Well, much of the blame falls somewhat unbelievably to the actions of a single man, Graham Anderson Martin, the American ambassador to South Vietnam at the time, who steadfastly refused to agree to start an evacuation for fear of mass panic. And he also had an unshakable faith that superior American firepower would keep the enemy at bay. Despite this, recommendations did go out ahead of the operation, saying that at-risk people should leave the country. This resulted in a total of about 50,000 people, including a few thousand orphans, leaving via various planes in the months leading up to an actual evacuation. This was mostly done via supply aircraft who would bring supplies in and then load up as many people as they could for the trip home. Yet an official full-scale evacuation, which would have seen these efforts massively ramped up, was continually stalled by Martin. Military brass tried and failed to persuade Martin to change his mind, with Brigadier General Richard E. Carey going as far as traveling to Saigon to plead personally with the ambassador. This was a meeting Carey would later diplomatically call cold and non-productive, and it should be noted that it took place on April the 13th, two weeks after preparations were already supposed to have begun for the mass evacuation. This back and forth continued until April the 28th, when North Vietnamese forces bombed the Tan Son Nut air base, effectively eliminating any possibility of getting people out via large aircraft capable of mass evacuation. When this was pointed out to Martin, he still refused to call for the evacuation, deciding to wait until the next day so that he could drive out to the base and confirm the damage for himself. Upon finding out that the Vietnamese forces had indeed destroyed the airbase and the best option for mass evacuation, he finally relented. This was an order that was relayed to soldiers on the ground via the official armed forces radio station by the words, the temperature in Saigon is 105 degrees and rising, followed by the playing of the song, I'm Dreaming of a White Christmas by Bing Crosby. As a direct result of Martin's stubbornness, the military had no choice but to rely on the least effective means of mass evacuation, and that would be helicopters with the operation officially commencing later that afternoon at 1400 hours. 
Even as the operation began, Martin's bullheaded refusal to prepare in any way for an evacuation caused problems for certain helicopter pilots, most notably the ones trying to evacuate him and his staff. How was this? Well, there was a large tree in the embassy courtyard that military brass had strongly advised Martin cut down so as to better allow helicopters to land there should the worst happen. Martin, believing that doing so would be as good as admitting the war had already been lost, absolutely refused to do this. As Henry Kissinger would later note, faced with imminent disaster, Martin decided to go down with the ship. On that note, to his credit, Martin refused to leave once the evacuation had begun, though this was much to the annoyance of the pilot, Colonel Jerry Berry, who was sent to fetch him. Instead, Martin continually had refugees boarded while he simply waited with his staff in his office, knowing that as long as he was there, the helicopter would keep coming back, allowing more lives to be saved. It wasn't until the 14th trip that an exhausted Berry finally reached his wit's end. Said Berry, I called the sergeant over, and he got in the cockpit, and I said, this is it. Get all these people off. This helicopter's not leaving the roof until the ambassador's on board. The president sends. With an order supposedly from the president himself, though not actually in reality, Martin finally relented and allowed Berry to complete his mission by transporting Martin and his entourage. Of course, what the military brass had failed to remember after this supposed last flight was that they'd accidentally left almost a dozen soldiers behind the compound. This wouldn't be realized for many hours, but all 11 Marines were rescued after being forced to barricade themselves on the rooftop for the night in case of an attack. Leaving the evacuations as late as Martin did understandably resulted in mass panic across Saigon, with many thousands of South Vietnamese citizens fleeing in everything from cars to stolen planes and helicopters. In addition, lack of time meant that helicopter pilots had a laughable amount of people to rescue, resulting in many ignoring the recommended weight limit of their craft and massively overloading them to the very extremes of what they could handle, given the pilot's assessments and weather conditions. In one case, one pilot noted he was overweight to the point that he could only hover inches off the ground, but no one was willing to get off, as for many, it would mean their life if they couldn't get out of the country. He then stated he thought if he could get some forward speed, he could get the additional lift needed, so simply pitched the craft forward and took a dive off the rooftop that he was on, barely recovering before hitting the rooftops below and then managing to very slowly climb from there. As for these pilots, they were instructed to ferry evacuees to waiting ships in the South China Sea, many of which quickly began to run out of space, resulting in people sleeping double in the small bunks as well as just anywhere on the ships that there was available space for someone to sit or lie down. On top of that, any South Vietnamese pilots that could manage to get a hold of their own helicopters and flee to sea were also crowding the decks as they arrived. This resulted in the order to push some of the South Vietnamese helicopters overboard in order to make more space. Indeed, some pilots were even ordered to simply crash their helicopters into the ocean and await rescue after they'd dropped any passengers off. So this all brings us around to the incredible story of Major Buang Li. Knowing he and his family, a wife and five children, would in all likelihood be executed if they couldn't find a way out of the country immediately, the Major managed to commandeer a small Cessna 01 spotter plane. Under heavy fire, he managed to take off and flee the country with two adults and five children jam-packed aboard the tiny, slow-moving aircraft. He then headed out to sea in search of a ship to land on or ditch the plane next to. About an hour and a half off the coast, with only about an hour hour of fuel left, he finally found one in the form of the USS Midway. The issue now was that there wasn't sufficient room to land on the ship owing to the number of helicopters on the deck. Unable to find the right frequency on the radio to talk to those on Midway, Bang resorted to dropping notes. The first two notes unfortunately blew away before anyone on board could grab them. One tied the third to his gun and dropped it. When the crew aboard retrieved it, they saw it read, Can you move the helicopter to the other side? I can land on your runway. I can fly one hour more. We have enough time time to move. Please rescue me. Major Buang, wife and five child. The captain of the vessel, one Lawrence Chambers, then had a decision to make. While it was possible to move some of the helicopters out of the way, there was no room to move them all. The young captain, only appointed to that post some five weeks before, decided that there was little chance the family would all survive if they tried to ditch in the sea next to the midway and be rescued that way. When a man has the courage to put his family in a plane and make a daring escape like that, you have to have the heart to let him in. 
So, thinking he'd likely be court-martialed for it, he made the call to move the helicopters that could be moved and dump the rest in the ocean after stripping them of any valuable gear that could be removed quickly. In total, some $10 million, that's about $65 million today worth of helicopters, were ditched in this way. There was another problem, however. The plane in question typically needed a minimum of a little over 600 feet of runway to land and come to a full stop. The midway itself in total was about 1,000 feet long, but the runway deck was about two-thirds of that, meaning the margin of error was basically zero. Thus, in order to land such a craft on the deck with enough margin of safety, the ship really needed to be moving as fast as possible to make the plane's relative speed slow enough that it could stop in time before falling off the end. Using the cable system to stop the craft faster wasn't deemed a good option, as in all likelihood it would just have resulted in the landing gear being ripped off or the plane flipping over in a spectacular crash. Unfortunately, Chambers had previously granted the ship's engineers permission to take the Midway's engines partially offline for routine maintenance. After all, helicopters did not need or want that relative wind, especially when landing on a crowded deck. Said Chambers, When I told the chief engineer that I needed 25 knots, he informed me that we didn't have enough steam. I ordered him to shift the hotel load to the emergency diesels. With this, the ship was able to achieve the requested speed, and Wang's landing was also helped by another 15 knots of headwind, further reducing his needed stopping distance. With that done and the deck as cleared as it was going to be, Wang was given the green light to land, ultimately doing so with textbook precision and with plenty of deck to spare, becoming a rare individual in relatively modern times to land such an aircraft aboard a military carrier. And thankfully for Captain Lawrence, he was not court-martialed for ditching the rather valuable military hardware to save Major Buang and his family, and instead he enjoyed a continuance of his successful career, eventually retiring as a rear admiral. In the aftermath of Operation Frequent Winds, the US ships continued to hang around for a few days off the coast, trying to pick up as many refugees from the water as they could. Finally, the order was given to head home, forcing the commanders to leave many thousands of people that had been promised evacuation behind. Now, the chances are you're not a military pilot, but if you'd like to get into some vehicle action, you should absolutely check out the game Crossout. Crossout is an online vehicle action game set in a post-apocalyptic future. Basically, what you do is construct your own crazy vehicle from the ground up, including flying vehicles, by the way, with all sorts of different parts. It's a super fast-paced game with lots of different game modes, and you've got pretty much limitless freedom to create, and what you do to your vehicle is entirely up to you. You won't be doing any rescuing of refugees, but you will We'll be having a lot of fun. Join us on the battlefield for free using the link in the description below. And going through that link not only helps support this show, but you also get a free starter set with three extra weapons or a vehicle cabin. And thanks to Crossout for the sponsorship, and thank you for watching. <laughs>